we're going to jump right in and, um, and ask you, what led you to speak out? In one essay, uh, for example, you mentioned editing a story from Gaza to protect a reporter there. Did that have something to do with sparking your activism? And what other incidents brought you to this tipping point to, to out the media as you have? Thanks. Thanks so much, first of all, for your questions and for your introduction and for having me here. It's a real pleasure. Um, I spent five and a half years uh, in the hub of the international press in Israel, which is the AP, one of the biggest news organizations in the world. Um, and as time went by, having been a pretty innocent believer in the uh, role of the press starting out, I started noticing strange decisions that were made about uh, about, uh, <laughs> about the coverage. Cool one. Um, um, one that stood out is the one that you mentioned. Um, in the first serious round of fighting that we had in, in Gaza, this was the end of 2008, beginning of 2009, um, our reporter in, in the Gaza Strip, who's a Palestinian from Gaza, a, a very capable reporter and really, really good guy, uh, reported in the morning, one of the mornings early in, in the war, that Hamas fighters in Gaza were dressed like civilians and were being counted as civilians in the in the death toll. Okay. Now that's very important for an understanding of the war because in every story about the fighting in Gaza you have a death toll, the Palestinian death toll is very high and it's uh, it's interesting to know how many of those people are fighters and how many are are, are civilians. So that was an important piece of information. A few hours after um, uh, we put that in the story, AP stories go out in the morning and then are updated throughout throughout the day. Uh, we called the bureau. I was running the desk. Um, I was the, the editor in charge of uh, in charge of the story on the desk that day. And he sounded worried on the phone. And he said, um, we need to erase that detail from the story. And I uh, didn't have to ask. I understood that he had been spoken to, uh, that he had been threatened. I didn't want to ask him because I didn't know he was listening to, to the call in Gaza. Um, so I struck the detail from the story. And from that, from that point on, the AP did not mention um, that very uh, relevant piece of information. Um, I suggested to the editor uh, who was in charge of me in the bureau that day that we put an editor's note, um, we attach an editor's note to the story explaining to readers um, that we were conforming with Hamas censorship. So we couldn't say the specific piece of information um, that would have got our reporter in deep trouble or maybe worse. And I, I get that. I don't think the news is worth anyone's life. But I think we need to explain to readers that they're not getting the full story. My suggestion of appending an editor's note in this case was not uh, accepted, even though um, we would append an editor's note every time the Israeli military censored edited a story. Um, in, this, in this case, no note was, 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 uh, was appended, and the readers were never told that the story was being manipulated by, by Hamas. That was um, an early instance of a, of a decision that led me to question the, the decision making in, in the press corps. There were uh, more egregious examples later on that led me finally to, to publish those essays that you mentioned in 2014. Okay. Um, Getting, we'll get right back into that, but I'm sure a lot of us are wondering, I certainly am, uh, what brought a young man, teenager I believe, from Canada to Israel, that you continue to live in Israel, and how does that play into your story? I, I interviewed a lot of folks, and they all artists and whatnot, and they say, well, that's not important. And journalists often say, well, this, my story is not the story, but it does play into the story. Uh, so, what's your story and how did that play into that? Um, I journalism? finished high school when I was 17 in Toronto. I, um, I wanted to uh, take a year off. I've been reading a lot of um, uh, kind of Zionist books, um, A.D. Gordon, things like that. No, there are things that no one even knows about me anymore. Uh, so, you took a, ga a gap year? Or not. I took a gap year, it was supposed to be a gap year, that's right. And I went to work on a kibbutz in um, and about two hours north of Jerusalem, a kibbutz called Male Gilboa. If any of you know, it's a very small religious kibbutz on Male Gilboa, um, near Gochan. Um, and I worked with uh, cows, I worked in a dairy barn. And I intended to go back at the end of the year, but within uh, a month or two of arriving on this kibbutz, I, I understood that I was, that I was staying. And, um, it's been 21 years still there, so. Wow, wow. Did, did your folks follow you? Because I know they yes, did so well. two years after I went, um, I, I declared. Yes? We're switching out? You all can't hear? Sorry. 
You can't hear? Yeah, I was gonna Mike's not going to solve that problem. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's jeans. That's jeans, man. Does, does this work? He packs more into his story, more detail. I will try, though. I do, I do recognize that I have that problem. But, uh, we have a lot to say in a very short period of time. Um, I, I had declared at some point, I told my parents that I wasn't coming back to Toronto and that I was going to become an Israeli citizen. What that means, if you're 18, is that you get a draft notice and you get inducted. Um, so my parents uh, came initially for, for one year. This was two years after I had uh, gone myself. And they ended up staying. And I have one sister and she came with them. Wow. And she ended up staying. And I mar married an Israeli and I have a few Israeli kids. And I'm, pretty, I'm there, it's, it's, it's over. I didn't know if any of that sparked your interest in journalism. At what particular point? Um, if you look at, uh, I don't remember the moment that I decided I wanted to be a journalist, but if um, you look at my eighth grade yearbook, which you should not, you should not do, um, there's a very nerdy picture of me, and underneath the picture it says, what do you want to be when you grow up, and it says journalist. Um, so I always kind of thought I would do something, uh, something like this. Here All I am. right, back to our regularly scheduled program then. Um, so why do you think the Palestinians have been so successful in this in, in the, over the last 10, 15 years in particular, and having their narrative portrayed as being the persecuted uh, victims and, and, of course, Israel being the evil occupying, occupying force? Um, why has that been so widely accepted by the media and the so-called you know, progressives? And more importantly, even, which you know, this is something we all share, I'm sure, you know, why after only 70 years after the Holocaust do progressives accept that every people have the right to self-determination except the Jews? You know, what is the media's incentive and, and how have they gotten along this far with this propaganda war? Okay, and this should only take three or four hours to answer if I speak really, really fast. Um, <laughs> Add another hour because he's going to speak slowly. Uh, I think there's a few things going on. I'm just, I'll try to uh, make it uh, less than three or four hours. There's a few things going on. One is that people need simple stories. What's going on in the Middle East is incredibly complicated. If you want to understand the Middle East, you have to understand at least um, 100 years of, of, of Zionist history. You need to understand the history of, of Islam. Um, you need to understand dozens of actors who are currently in play in the Middle East, the Iranians, um, the Americans, the Russians, the Kurds, radical Islamic factions on the Sunni side, radical Islamic factions on the Shia side, the Israelis, the Palestinians, Hamas, Islamic Jihad. It's very, very complicated. And if you really try to come to grips with what's going on, you're just left with a headache. Um, and it's hard to fit, or impossible rather, to fit into a 600 word news story or a 90 second TV spot. So you need a simple, you need a simple story. The simple story um, um, is created in Israel by, by framing the conflict in a certain way and by eliminating certain facts and concentrating on other facts. So we're told that there's an Israeli-Palestinian conflict, um, when in fact there is no Israeli-Palestinian conflict any more than there was a, a Belgian-German conflict in 1915. Right? Have you heard about the Belgian-German conflict of 1915? No, because it was called the First World War, right? It was, it was a world war in which the Belgians played a part and so did the Germans, but you can't understand it if all you know is Belgium and, and Germany. It has to be understood in a regional, uh, regional context. The war uh, between Israelis and Palestinians, of course, um, even if we're just looking at those two uh, actors, started about 100 years ago, long before there was an occupation, which is the uh, kind of heart of the news coverage, the Palestine Liberation Organization, uh, which one might think was founded to um, liberate the West Bank and Gaza, was in fact founded in 1964, which is three years before uh, the West Bank and Gaza were captured by Israel. So clearly we have a conflict that's much older and broader than the way it's presented, but we need a simple story. So the media has created a simple story. What adds an added um, emotional punch, or I think the secret ingredient of the story, what makes this story so resonant for so many people, and the, the reason that it triggers such unique responses in the West, like boycott, or you know, attacks on synagogues, or you know, worse, attacks on Jews in Europe, for example, um, the reason for that is that the actor, one of the two actors in this simple story, the bad guy 
And the story is also a character who happens to have played a role in the Western imagination for about 2,000 years and is plugged into the Western intellectual DNA in a pretty deep way as, as a character who represents moral failure. So if you look at the, um, you know, the early history of uh, of Christianity, for example, you'll see that when, when early Christians wanted to talk about their opponents or, or people who, um, you know, who morally just didn't get it, then they would, they would talk about Jews. In those days, the issue was theological. So Jews uh, were people who put an overemphasis on legalism and, um, and were not compassionate. And that was um, the problem at the time. Later on, it becomes about greed. So greed is a problem. And so you project that characteristic on, onto Jews. The Jews are kind of like a blank screen who exist in almost every society in the West. And you take whatever characteristic occupies your mind at a, at a given time and you project it on, onto them. Um, later on, the world becomes more ideological. Karl Marx writes an absolutely astonishing essay, which some of you might have read, called On the Jewish Question. Marx is creating this um, incredibly influential ideological system called communism. And he writes an essay explaining who the enemies of communism are. The enemies of communism, he writes, are are Jews. He says money, which he hates, is the god of the Jews. And hucksterism is the Jewish religion. And mankind must be emancipated, not from capitalism, which is what you'd expect Marx to say, but from Judaism. It's an absolutely amazing essay. You can find it online. And at the exact same time, people who are the enemies of communism identify communism as Jewish. So they talk about Jewish Bolsheviks and Jewish commissars. It's not Latvian Bolsheviks and Latvian commissars, and it's not Swiss bankers. It's Jewish bankers. Um, later on, you know, the, it takes a kind of scientific or pseudo-scientific term, so people get into racial purity. Who is the opponent of racial purity? Who is the example of what is impure? The Jews. Um, in the modern world, or in, uh, in, in uh, at least large segments of the modern world, the organizing ideological principle is human rights. That's what it is right now in 2016, right? Religion in, in many parts of, of the West is uh, not, not what it was. Communism, of course, is dead. The old ideological frameworks are, are gone. Of course, no one can believe in racial science anymore. Now people believe in human rights. That's supposed to be the universal principle. Who is the prime antagonist of human rights? What's a country called Israel? And if you look at the UN Human Rights Council, uh, you know, as an example, you'll see not that Israel has been condemned by the UN Human Rights Council more times than any other country, because that would be crazy. Um, it's been condemned by the UN Human Rights Council more times than all other countries on Earth combined, uh, with very little comment from, um, from the press. And there are other examples, of course. The only ethnic group that's currently subject to boycott attempts in the West is, is Jews, right? So strange things are, are going on, and I think that's why. It's a blank screen onto which the negative characteristics of the age are being projected. Yeah, and it's such an interesting from that, that's the simplistic story and that complex story to hear it that way. It's, it's, because I know what I'm having to answer to my college kids and whatnot, you know, that's, that's good. Right, the other side is a very simple story. A simple story. It's just a picture, that picture, the classic picture of the tank and the kid. Now that's, it's not entirely fictional, right? There is some truth in that picture, but it's a tiny fragment of the story. But they have a simple story and it sticks. But versus that complexity, which are all those moving parts, as you even, you know, said with World War II, you know, that it I mean, was... St start trying to explain it and you've lost, basically. Yeah. So, and I, I had the... Um, advantage and pleasure to hear you yesterday talking to our Yad and to our Hanani groups, the, the, uh, our young leaders, and you showed a video um, of, from what, uh, from the fact that your book is based on pumpkin flowers, and it was taking over this, this hill, which is a, um, was a, uh, a war maneuver that, that we never heard of. You know, we hear about the radar on Entebbe or the, the various conflicts, 69 war, etc. But this was something that it went on almost as a producer, a little ad nauseum, because it went on for like four or five minutes, and we're just seeing them overtake this hill and put the flag down. The, the Hezbollah troops claiming it as their own. So it was pure propaganda. And, and so what Mahdi explained to all of us is that um, this produced camera point of view is the new warfare. It, it's not who's winning ammo-wise, but it's the propaganda, and we all know this because we're saying, how can they be saying this? And it, it sheds the light all through the mass media. So first question is, 
when do you think that information, um, this information, journalism started to behave this way? When did it go awry? Um, has it always been produced and manipulated? Uh, when was, if, and if not, when was that line of demarcation that went from, uh, this is the news, Walter Cronkite, you know, without emotion, told you like it was, or maybe it wasn't. Yeah, I think if you look at the history of, of journalism, I mean, people remember Murrow and Cronkite and these guys as the voice of God who um, um, would just tell you, you know, what's going on and everyone would believe, would believe them. But the truth is, if you look at, um, if, if you read up on it, you'll see that journalism has always been an incredibly problematic profession, um, which is very susceptible to, to stuff like this. There was a book, I don't know if any of you read the book, Scoop which is um, a spoof, a kind of satirical novel about, about journalism, which is vicious about the way journalists manufacture events. Essentially, um, a, a correspondent gets sent to cover a war in a certain place. He gets off at the wrong train station. Um, so he invents a war in the town where he happened to get off. Um, and the war becomes real because it's reported. Um, and that's from the 30s. Scoop was written in the 30s. It's a, it's a great book. I, I recommend it. Orwell. Um, the great George Orwell, known for 19, uh, 1984, but um, he wrote uh, amazing political essays. He goes off to fight in the Spanish Civil War, and he writes essays which are, again, amazing after the Spanish Civil War. So this is like 1936-ish, and he says, you know, the, um, you know, I've, uh, I knew that the press sometimes get things, gets things wrong, but in Spain, for the first time, I saw reports that had absolutely no connection to battles that I was involved in. And he said the reporters are not reporting what happened, they're reporting what they think should have happened, uh, uh, judging from their uh, political affiliations. So if you were a Trotskyist, you know, you had one reality. If you were, a, you know, a pro-Soviet, then you had one. If you were a, a pro-Franco, you know, some, yeah. everyone's all something different. Um, an American example, um, Time Magazine in the Second World War, the Henry Luce um, papers, um, ran a propaganda campaign on behalf of Chiang Kai-shek in China. They decided that he was a heroic opponent of Japanese uh, uh, expansionism and or communism, um, and they um, they built him up as this great leader. And people who were in China uh, knew that he was a corrupt dictator. And there's a famous story about a marine who worked with uh, with Chiang Kai-shek's forces in China. Red Time couldn't believe the gap between what Time was between the BS that Time was reporting and what he was seeing on the ground. And he came back to America and changed to Newsweek. Um, so I think this is a this is a problem that's existed for a long time. Israel isn't the first time this has happened. It's just an extreme example, in part because there are so many reporters in Israel. So you're getting so much press coverage from Israel that the skewed coverage ends up being very, very extreme. And of course, it presses that button that we mentioned, which Spain doesn't and China doesn't. Which brings us to the next question about this skewed perspective and and proportionally, you know, the the numbers we hear from. You know, fatalities here versus fatality, who killed who, et cetera. So I it just, and we're all sitting here incredulous, like, doesn't the press realize? Well, of course they realize, but then you wonder how can all of mainstream, even the countries that are, are Israeli friendly, you know, the, the allies, how do they um, deal with this double standard? How do they justify? this double standard, and um, if you could give us some examples of the skewed perspective and proportion coming out of our news story. Sure, I mean, no reporter's ever gonna start off a news story by saying nothing happened today, right? No one in Jerusalem is gonna report a story that says today there were 10,000 peaceful interactions between Jews and Arabs in Jerusalem. Um, that's not a story. So you can it count happens, on any reporter. It? Yeah, it happens most days. Um, um, you can count on reporters to sell the story. Again, this isn't malevolence, right? It's not like an evil conspiracy. This is, a lot of it is just the way the profession works. I can't write a story that says nothing happens, and if I um, go a couple weeks without writing a story, my employer is going to start wondering why, they're, why I'm being employed. So I have to produce news, and it has to be exciting, no matter what's going on. Um, so there's a, a pretty dramatic conflict story being exported from Jerusalem. Let's just take Jerusalem, for, for example. That's the city where I live, and that's the kind of epicenter of, of the conflict. Um, conflict is really Jerusalem's brand. So if you say to someone in the West, Paris, you know, they think fashion. Or if you say Rome, they think, I don't know, what do you think when I say Rome? Food? Vatican. What's that? The Vatican. Yeah, the Vatican, right. And if you say Jerusalem, then people think conflict. Can it be divided, Jews and Arab? And 
and so on and so forth. Um, if you look at the numbers, which no one ever does, um, because it would pull the rug under, out from under the story, and that's also it's kind of a crude comparison, but it's a worthwhile one, and I'll do it for you now because no one else will do it for you. If you look at the numbers uh, in Jerusalem in 2015, last year, Jerusalem is a city the size of Jacksonville, Florida. Um, is there anyone here from Jacksonville, Florida? Yeah. So I don't insult. That's right. Oh, that's right. You're from it's Jacksonville, Florida. Joel, I'm sorry. Okay. It's also the size of Indianapolis. <laughs> Are we on safe ground with, if I insult Indianapolis? Um, um, if you take every single person who died in violent circumstances in Jerusalem last year, and I'm including absolutely everyone, so I'm including victims of terror attacks, and we had a wave of stabbing attacks that you probably heard about. Um, if you include the terrorists themselves, if you include members of the security services and unarmed people and armed people and Jews and Arabs and people who were killed in regular, regular homicides, domestic um, criminal things like that, the number of people who were killed in, uh, in Jerusalem last year is 37. Now, that's, that's 37 too many for me. I live in Jerusalem with three kids, and it can be tense at times. I'm, 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 I'm aware. I want it to be zero. Um, and it's, uh, I'm not uh, pretending that there isn't a conflict. Okay, there is a conflict, and it's, it's complicated. Um, but in Indianapolis in 2015, where no American thinks there is a conflict, 144 people were murdered in the same period of time. That's four times as many. And in Jacksonville, which is a great place, and people who come from there are wonderful people, um, the number was 113. So that's three times as many as Jerusalem. And I'm not, and I'm not choosing extreme American examples like Chicago. I'm just choosing cities that happen to be the same size is Jerusalem. Um, so people, I think, don't understand that the, the scope, the vast scope of the coverage, which can also be quantified in terms of numbers of, of reporters, um, and the tiny scale of the conflict, um, when you put them next to each other, it's, it's absurd. So with this going on, as brilliant and as tech savvy as Israel is, and as fully aware as Israel is that this is going on, why have they let it go on so long? You, you, you know, um, we just feel like we're losing the propaganda war, but I have a feeling that's not, the story isn't that simple. Uh, no, I think we are. I think we are. Um, uh, I think it's a war, this is depressing, and I apologize, but I think it's a war we can't win. Um, there are certain things that Israel's very good at. There's certain things that the West is very good at. This is a broader problem than Israel. Um, the West is good at building constructive societies that give people good lives, um, that give rights to women, that provide health care, um, and provide a kind of bubble in which normal life is possible. Western societies are good at that. Um, but they're not good at telling really um, simple stories about, about themselves. So the video that we watched last night, which shows a Hezbollah, an ostensibly a Hezbollah victory, where they stormed the outpost, Outpost Pumpkin, which, which this book is about, um, planted a flag on top and declared, we captured the outpost when they had never set foot in the outpost. That's an example of a simple story told through images. Um, the tank and the kid. Right, that's a simple story told through images. Um, more recently in the Gaza fighting, you know, rubble, rubble in Gaza and dead civilians, and an Israeli F-16. That's a simple, that's a simple story. Um, and we can't compete with it because our story is more, more complicated. Our idea of what victory is is, is much more uh, complicated. It requires more, more explanation. So we can be tech savvy and we can invent everything. Apparently we invented everything. Um, I think there are a few things you might have invented, but I think we invented most things. Uh, well, you've improved on what we might have invented. That's, that's right. Um, um, the cherry tomato, of course, and et cetera, et cetera. Drip irrigation. Um, and basically virtually everything that's useful. Um, but you can't, um, you can't, we can't tell stories like that. We don't have that kind of simple, powerful story that presses, that presses a button. Our case is much more complicated. And because the media landscape is what it is, it needs to be something that fits in 600 words or 90 seconds on TV. We don't have that kind of story. We don't have a story that can fit in 600 words. You can't fit 100 years of, of, of history in the land of Israel in 600 words. You can fit a tank and a kid in 600 words. That goes into the 600 words, and that's what people get on their screen. Um, so, sort of twofold again. Question: um, One would be. That's a classic how, journalistic tactic, by the way. How do you? I have one question. <laughs> two parts. Don't laugh on, Mike. Um, all right. 
how can you tell the difference between an article that fairly portrays the negative aspects of what Israel might be doing, and, you know, versus the ones that are way off base, that are that are not fair, um, anti-Israeli bias, and then also which of the media in the U.S. in Europe, uh, whether it has has the the worst anti-Israeli kind of part and parcel, of this worst anti-Israeli agenda, um, and is there a Jewish or other organization that has an effective tool to counter it? In other words. You know, if, if we can pull out our, should we all be pulling out our shortwave radios? But I guess we don't need that anymore. It's just the computers. And which site, you know, where can we find a, um, a station or a viable source to listen to? I know I, I, I grew up overseas at, at one point, and we, we listened to the Voice of America, because that seemed to be sort of the European and American voice. But is there a voice? that you would suggest for us? Uh, as to, to the first question, um, how do you know when you see uh, um, you know, a fair right, portrayal of negative characteristics um, suggests that Israel has negative characteristics? So you must be some kind of anti-Zionist, even for suggesting <laughs> such a thing, because Israel has, Israel has no negative characteristics. Cut. It is purely positive. Okay. Uh, so that problem simple is not Simple story. Exactly. Done. Simple story. Everything's great. Um, no, it, it's, it's a great question. I think the test is, can you understand Israel's um, rationale? Does the story explain what, what Israelis are thinking, even if their actions seem to you to be negative? So if you see an airstrike in Gaza that killed civilians, which happens and is tragic, does the, does the article try to explain to you why that happened? What Israelis uh, think when they send that airplane? Um, if you read a story about, um, you know, which are the stories that are written every day, why the peace process isn't going anywhere, why Netanyahu is obstructionist, why is not playing ball with the administration, why he's dragging his feet. Does the reporter try to explain why sane, rational Israelis don't want to make the moves that the West wants them to make? Right? Israelis, when they look at the reality in the Middle East, they see something completely different than people, people in the West. We understand that when you create a vacuum, it gets filled by very scary people and things get bad very quickly. Um, that's why people um, are afraid to pull the military out of the West Bank. And it's not because Israelis are crazy or religious fanatics or support settlements necessarily. Polls show that most Israelis do not support settlements. They're afraid. They live in the Middle East and they're afraid. And they're right to be afraid. Um, so does the reporter explain that? And, and in almost all cases, the answer is no. The reporters don't explain that. Um, so I, I would say that's the, that's the test. Um, as for what you can consume, that's a tricky question. Um, there are um, you know, some, some, yes, exactly. Thank you for pointing that out. Basically, it's basically his book. If you read the book, you don't need to consume anything else ever. <laughs> so, so thank you for pointing out. No, um, there's a. Um, if you're interested in daily news, a uh, good, d decent site is the Times of Israel, which does a good kind of. Um, wrap up of daily news as seen from Israel, which is uh, which is important. Sometimes you'll see good um, good reporting in, in mainstream international <laughs> press outlets. Um, there's a reporter I like um, for the New York Times named Dia Hadid, who writes interesting stories about the Palestinians, and you'll you'll see interesting stuff. Um, my advice is usually not to consume that much daily news because the bump, and it's true, I think probably in America too, but uh, I don't know enough about it. Um, the bombardment of daily news, the bombardment of detail, the endless news cycle just ends up driving you crazy. So you can consume a ton of information and Israel would be, you know, rocket here, attack here, politics here, Abbas said this, Netanyahu said that. You can do it for three months. Um, you will have learned nothing and nothing will have changed by the end of the kind three months. Kind of like months. The, the candidates well, I was, campaigning. I was flipping, I mean, I was watching your news channels here last night and you could see how you could just get involved in the, the, you know, and you're not really learning anything. So the thing to do is to read books. Um, which is an old school suggestion, I know. And I don't mean just this one. Well, of course, you should start with this one and buy, you know, six or seven copies because they're all every every copy is different. Um, but there are, there are some good. <laughs> there are some good. Um, good, you know, there 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 have been really good books written about Israel, including including a few that have come out recently, um, like Dreamers which is a book by Yossi Klein Halevi um, that takes the lives of seven paratroopers 
from 1967, who liberated Jerusalem in 1967, and tells her life story as a way of looking at the different political trends in Israel since 1967. That's a really good book. Um, there's a book that did well here in America last year called My Promised Land, written by a guy named Ari Shami. Um, and, and there are other books that are, you know, that are older that'll give you more of a, a broad historical perspective on, on the place. And I think that's time better spent, uh, if you ask me. All right, I, I forgot to mention, of course, that a lot of the questions presented tonight have already, you know, the CRC and Robin uh, canvassed uh, many folks in our community for their questions. But we, we do have some time for additional questions from you all. And then I reserve for, for one last question to call it, call it quits for the evening. Um, there is there's one that came in uh, wondering about any response in Israel to the terrible situation of the Syrian refugees. Um, we wouldn't expect Israel to necessarily take them all in, but what financial assistance or at least some statement might raise Israel's international image? Uh, and there have, um, there, there has been um, Israeli activity on the Syrian, uh, on the Syrian issue. Two things that I know about: uh, an organization called Israel um, has been helping Syrian refugees, not just in our immediate vicinity, but on the refugee trail in, in Greece. Um, they also have representation in, in uh, uh, the Kurdish part of Iraq. Often they fly kind of under the radar. They don't hang a big Israeli flag out of the clinic, but, um, but they're very active and it's a great, great, great organization uh, to support. Um, there um, are a lot of, a lot, there are, is a certain number of um, wounded Syrians being treated in Israeli hospitals. The Israeli military has um, a kind of transfer point with uh, medics and doctors on the border, on the Golan, the border between Israel and Syria. And um, bizarrely, you know, incredibly, the Middle East just moves so fast you can't keep track of it. Um, Israel's treating fighters from the Syrian civil war. So if you go to the hospital in my parents' town, Naharia, um, there, are, there are Syrians there who are wounded in, in the fighting and they're kind of patched up to the point where they can be sent back to Syria and then they are in the hospital in Sfat, which is also one of our northern hospitals. You'll see Syrians around. Um, so there are small steps being, being done. Um, there, uh, uh, there has been no mass movement of Syrian refugees toward Israel. The countries have been at war for, you know, for decades. Um, I think many Syrians are probably scared of, of Israel. Uh, certainly Israelis are scared of an influx of, of Syrians. This is an enemy population, even though you know, we're the least of their problems right now. Um, so Israel has taken small steps while trying basically to stay, you know, to stay out of it to the extent possible. Okay. Questions? And we have a microphone here where you can just stand up and speak. Actually, that appears just to be Pardon a stand. Me? Pardon? Oh, okay. okay, but Chris? Okay. Chris Krauss? Uh, I'd like you to speak a little more about the um, human rights narrative that you are not comfortable with um, and I, I, I mean I, I don't buy that it's too complicated answer as an educator that's all we do we are trying to find ways to make it simple right. knowing that's not the full story so what's a better narrative and it's hard to see anything wrong with a human rights narrative um, w when you say human rights narrative, you mean just you say, you explain that that's the way people uh, see issues the world. get framed, yeah. and that's problematic. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Now, right? I mean, it's hard. You don't. No one wants to be against human rights, right? Um, so when you criticize things like the UN Human Rights Council or organizations like Human Rights Watch or Amnesty, you're taking a risk of being against human rights. What kind of terrible person would be against human rights? Right? It's something you can't argue with. But once you have um, contact with the actual organizations in question, you see that many of them are incredibly problematic because, like any organization of human beings, they're you know they have politics, they have a, a bias, they have groupthink, uh, they're affected by you know, the assumptions of their social group and of their of their society. And if you look at the UN Human Rights Council or the two human rights groups that I mentioned, you'll see an inordinate focus on the state of Israel. Um, so pointing that out um, isn't to be against the idea of human rights. On, on, on the contrary, if you are for human rights, you need to insist that Israel be treated like any other country. Otherwise, it's a mockery of the idea of human rights. I mean, clearly, the fact that Israel has been condemned by the Human Rights Council more times than China or 
Iran, or the entire world combined makes a mockery of the idea of human rights, which is, um, by the way, I think why it happens, because the Human Rights Council is uh, the countries who sit on it are countries like China and Iran, and they're trying to make a mockery of the idea of human rights. So if you're a fighter for human rights, you need to insist that Israel be seen in the context in which it exists. There are human rights problems in Israel. There are human rights problems in Israel. There are human rights problems in America. The uh, US military has had a few human rights problems. Um, war uh, involves human rights problems. That's the way it is. It needs to be seen you know, through rational and cool eyes without picking on one character. And, and, I think this still goes to that, that perspective and proportion of perspective, because there were some numbers you threw out that there are more reporters in Israel jumping on this story than there are in China, or there are, where did, in India, or? I just made up those numbers. Yeah, well. No, um, they, when, I, when I started to work at JP in 2006, uh, we, we had more than 40 news staffers. That's just an, as an example of the inordinate focus. The press and the human rights world are largely overlap. It's the same social group. Um, we had more than 40 people reporting the Israel story, which is 8 million Israelis, 4 million Palestinians. That's basically the extent of it. We're talking about um, 1 one hundredth of 1% 1 of the world's surface. 0.01%. Um, it was more reporters, that 40 uh, was more reporters than we had at the time, 2006, we, AP, had in China, which is 1.3 billion people. Um, it was more than we had in India. It was more than we had in Sub-Saharan Africa. It's more than 50 countries. Uh, it was more than we had in all the countries where the Arab Spring eventually erupted combined. Um, so that's not you know, human rights, and that's not journalism, that's an obsession. It's a fixation that, let alone what it does to Israel and to the Jews, which is bad, I think that goes without saying, it makes it impossible to understand the world. Because if you think Israel is the world's biggest human rights problem, you do not understand planet Earth. Um, and if you think that Israel is more important than China, then you're also really going to have a hard time figuring out what's going on in the world. And that's the problem with the Jewish obsession always. Right? If you're a German, in the 20s and your economy has collapsed, you can do two things. You can try to figure out actually why your currency has collapsed and why your economy is a mess. Or you can blame the Jews. And if you blame the Jews, uh, obviously that's going to be bad for the Jews, but it's and you can do it bad for the Jews, as you may have heard. Um, but it's, um, it's uh, going to be bad for Germany because you can't fix your economy if you think the Jews are ruining it. Ruining it. Um, similarly, if you think the main problem on planet Earth in 2016 is the occupation of the West Bank, you will be unable to understand the planet or fix the things that need fixing. Uh, that's what makes it so important to understand the obsession beyond our own kind of parochial interest in the fate of the Jews. After your a little louder. Oops. After after your thorough exposés of media bias and distortion and coverage of the uh, uh, 2014 Gaza war, uh, was anything heard from the journalism community besides howls of righteous indignation? Did, did any of your colleagues Good look question. at their uh, journalistic ethics and? Uh, uh, start producing more objective stories? Um, it's, a great, it's a great question. Uh, to put it simply, the opposition to my essays was very loud, and the support for them was very quiet. Uh, but there was support. I got some surprising emails from surprised people. I'm not, I'm not the only person who noticed that there's a problem. Right? The numbers that, I, that I'm giving for the numbers of reporters, are, those are objective. Those are, you know, those are the numbers. And it's hard to be a sane person and say that makes sense. Uh, and a lot of people get get it. Um, if you want to keep your job, it's something that you can't really say publicly. I, I, I found myself in a kind of unique position, which is that I had had these experiences in the international press corps, but I, I was pretty young, um, but I no longer needed the, the, the job. Uh, so I could kind of write, write those essays knowing that I was burning that bridge. For most reporters my age in the international press corps, with another 20, 30 years to go in your career, you just can't write that. You can't write that essay. I mean, if you think it, and a lot of people, and a lot of people think it. Um, did it make change in the way the Israel story is covered? And basically, you know, I can point to a few tiny things that are not fiction. Uh, but, but basically, you know, um, the, the press corps, which is kind of a part of an important and creepy uh, thing going on in, in kind of the liberal West, in terms of the zeitgeist in the, the liberal West, it's kind of like an aircraft carrier, right? It's a that's a good metaphor for it. Um, this part of the country, um, an, air, an aircraft carrier, it's very, it doesn't turn easily, right? 
it's just sailing. And I'm got in a rowboat whacking on the side of the aircraft carrier. So I mean, some people might hear me whacking on the side of the aircraft carrier, and some people did, obviously, but the carrier goes where you know where it wants to go, and uh, I haven't seen a major shift. Okay, Bob, Ruben. Uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, is he going to be there for a while, or is it possible? What's your assessment of him? Do you think he's going to be there? Uh, the other question, the question is, how long, how much longer do we have to have? Uh, he seems kind of like the eternal prime minister. Um, um, he seems to have been around, around forever. It's, uh, because our political system is so weird, um, right, it's not a two-party system. Uh, someone once said that American politics is checkers, and Israeli politics is three-dimensional chess. We have a dozen political parties, and they all, uh, no party has ever won the majority. David Ben-Gurion never won 50% of the vote in Israel. No one's ever won a majority in Israel. So it ends up being a coalition. The coalitions are very rickety. They fall apart frequently. And then there are new elections. So it's very hard. It's very hard to say. Netanyahu, who seems like a perennial uh, prime minister, actually only has 25% of the vote. He has, 20, he has a quarter of the Knesset. That's not a lot. He's not a popular prime minister. In fact, people don't really like him. He's not a likable character in the way that uh, Sharon, for example, is likable or Rabin. Israelis really don't have the same affinity for him. Um, he's just a guy who um, is competent and uh, or more competent than, you know, than the, other, the other options. And his kind of dark view of the Middle East, which he's been um, you know, consistently putting forward since the 90s, um, was borne out by events. <laughs> that's, that's why the right is in power. Could it shift that? Absolutely. I mean, I think that if the center, um, or, or you know, maybe not the left, because the left is going to have a hard time, but if you know, a center left candidate, a guy like Gabe or Lee or something like that, if they can come up with a coherent uh, a platform and a good candidate, I think they could um, I think they can give you your for his money. I think if the right is smart, they'll come up with another candidate, because I think people are tired of the now in Israel. And I think the right should run to price they want to win. If they want to keep winning, they should probably come up with another different charismatic Company uh, but, but there's a reason that the president can only be president for eight years. That's a good idea. That's a good idea. We need to kind of freshen, freshen up the ranks. And I, I would hope that that would happen sooner rather than later. Okay. We have at the mic, and then and we'll take you. And yeah, he wants to ask questions. One, two, three. We'll do that. You're up. He wants to go. You, you're up instead. You're a place setter for him. No, no, I, I want to. No, okay. okay. All right. Good evening. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I'm Japanese, and that was very interesting about that, those, the light wingness. Um, and uh, Japan has a propaganda war that they're fighting too, but we're talking about Israel tonight. And then um, people, do they get very, like younger generations, they are patriotic, and then do they get kind of ultra patriotic and then become more like Israel's the great nation and then mm -hmm. say something negative. But that's what, that's something happening in Japan and I'm like kind of ashamed. More nationalism in the younger generation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that is happening in Japan? Yeah, that's happening in Japan because of those like uh, anti, you know, the propaganda war that we have to fight against. Mm -hmm. But that's not what I wanted to um, talk about. Anyway, you don't have it in Israel? Um, it plays out. It plays out differently oh, in Israel. Okay. Um, All right. It's hard to say exactly where the younger Israeli generation is. I wouldn't say that they're um, more nationalistic than older. So it's not. That much. Anyway, I came to the Virginia Beach about 11 years ago. I didn't know anything about the Judaism. Um, I was not really buying to the media that you were fighting against, but I was, you know, watching these and so on. And I came to here and I met Rabbi and I started to go to congregations and that's been very wonderful. And I started to hear the side of your story. I thought that was powerful and very interesting. I was very interested, so I started to look into it. And I understood, okay, this is what Jewish people are. And now when I speak with my Japanese friends, they think that I, um, I was bought by Jews. You, know, you were what? You know, like uh, I... Bought by. Bought I, you know, I do have this, I am I, um, um, advocating for Jews. I say, like, okay, you saw that on the media, you saw it on TV. 
Before you would jump into the conclusion, please read this one too. And then I would kind of, but there aren't many things in Japanese written, written in Japanese. And then I think that um, English is spoken and lots of Japanese speak English too, but if the Israel does those kind of anti-propaganda in other languages, I think that would be very powerful too, because I feel like, okay, I'll translate, I'll translate for you, so. Yeah, thank you. Um, one thing that, that's certainly true in, in what you said is that we're very focused on, on the West um, in, our, in our travails in, in the Western world. There's a whole world out there that is in the Western, um, you know, like Japan, I was recently in China, and um, it's kind of, um, it's basically virgin territory. People don't know anything, and there are some Israeli organizations, including the Israeli government, that are increasingly putting efforts into places like China, um, Latin America, India, um, as a way of kind of <laughs> there's a lot to be, I still feel there's still so much to be done, but do they have reasons why they're not? I don't know. Um, in the back, yes, you're next, and then because you were waiting in line at the mic, and then we have over here, and then we have over there. So, for the moment. Hi. Um, <coughs> I'm studying communication, and I'm hoping to be a journalist one day. So, yeah. <laughs> what? You um, said that very quiet. Did you catch that? <laughs> um, basically, uh, I would. But my question is, what would you suggest for like future journalists? <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm From just, there you can go anywhere. Yeah, that's my only question. No, um, just like, what do you suggest as like for someone who's hoping to be a journalist one day? Um, well, that's a good question. Um, I, if there's one thing I can say um, in, um, to it, anyone who's hoping to be a journalist is it's really good to, to um, have a uh, concrete field of expertise for a foreign language that you speak really well. That's more important than going to journalism school or, or anything else. If you speak, for example, fluent Russian, uh, and, you sh and you can write in English. When you show up in Moscow, chances are you'll find something to do there journalistically because that's a rare talent. If you speak fluent Arabic, there are very few people who uh, can write in English and speak fluent Arabic. Um, it's very, that, that would be my, uh, uh, my, my advice for the foreign language. Learn um, an area of expertise that's useful to, to journalism, economics. Almost no journalists understand how that works. Okay. Uh, it's <laughs> Science. Um, so if you come at the profession with a real expertise in a field that not a lot of people know about, then you have a competitive advantage that's worth more in my opinion than a, a journalism school degree. Okay. Um, if that doesn't work out, then don't blame me. Um, <laughs> okay, your advice earlier was to read, so I don't want to lose our audience before they have a chance to. Oh, straight, did I mention right off the press as of last week? But uh, we have two more questions, and then I have my one little wrap question. So, not done in rap, just wrap it up question. Because uh, I know some of you might expect that I would. But um, who was it that was waiting? Because we have, was a, I thought it was a woman back there. Yeah, right. Hmm? But we're here. Right there. Right there. The one posing as a woman. No, because you came late. It was, it was in this. Sorry, we're going to. One and two. Oh, you're. Okay, woman. Well, okay. Uh, there we go. I'm sorry. One, two, three. And we we'll, we'll sort of short answers here. Okay. In the back. I oh, just, well, okay. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to know, um, you mentioned a New York Times uh, reporter, author, that you said was very good, um, um, Palestinian, Israeli. Um, can, you, can you tell me his name again, please? Um, it's uh, the, the reporter who um, has been producing very interesting stories from the Palestinian side of things. Her name is Dia Hadid. Uh, <laughs> Dia, D-I-A-A. H-A-D-I-D, -D. and I'm not saying that politically you're going to love everything that, that she writes, but you'll learn a lot about what's going on. Uh, she's an example of a person who actually speaks Arabic, and knows Palestinian society, and gets it, and, and her writing is worth, uh, is worth following. You, you said H-A-I-D? H-A-D-I-D. H-A-D-I-D. Okay. By default, propagates everything that's going on as far as the conflict goes. That their yeah, fiction is basically creating reality. Um, the question was: uh, Has uh, media organizations taken responsibility for the kind of negative effects that their production has had on maintaining the conflict? Um, which, by the way, I think is, is true. I, mean, I think that the coverage of the West Bank conflict has been extremely negative. Um, the Palestinian media, 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 the
it has been elevated by the media from a, a, a small local problem that can be solved into a kind of cosmic issue of justice that cannot be solved because it's cosmic. Um, I think that's, that's very true. I, mean, I think there's a price in the real world for this kind of cosmic focus on, on Israel. The fact that the Israel-Palestinian concept has kind of become the symbol of conflict. Um, that's a big problem for those of us Israelis and Palestinians who are just human beings living on a piece of land and we have to kind of work it out and, and could probably if, if left alone. Um, and the answer is no. Um, the journalism world has not taken responsibility for its failures. In, in this story, there's very little accountability in journalism. For example, if you look at reporting, it was done from Tahrir Square during the uprising in Egypt, where the Western press unanimously agreed that democracy was breaking out in Egypt. You can go back and you can find the most prominent American journalists writing that story from Tahrir Square. Yeah. They were there not as journalists. They had their pom-poms on. They were cheering democracy in Egypt, which, by the way, would love to happen. Don't get me wrong. That's not what was happening there. Um, they were all completely wrong about what was happening in the Middle East, and they also have the government no price to be paid for it. Um, so it's a, it's a profession that doesn't lend itself to accountability. One last question. In the context of the negative media that Israel is getting, uh, what do you think would happen if the government in Israel will, if the Israel will elect a government, the government would be more centrist, maybe left center? How would that affect the media and the coverage around the world? I think that, I mean, first of all, I hope that would, I would like that to happen. Uh, um, I do not, and I, I think we might be able to change a bit of the vibe. You know, we could speak differently. Um, we wouldn't have a confrontational relationship with the American president, which I think is a bad idea for us. Um, however, I think very little would change on, no, well, nothing would change on the ground, right? Because no one's about to fly the West Bank. Even if the most left-wing Israeli leader is elected next week, no one's moving the military out of absolutely anywhere in the Middle East in 2016. The media point of view. From the media point of view, you might get you might get some more from the uh, you know well, the coverage might be a bit friendlier, but um, but I think that the um, you know, the obsession with Israel has very little to do with Israel and uh, with Israeli policy uh, because when you have an obsession when you're obsessed with a person or um, um, or the, you know or a celebrity or something that has nothing to do with the with the object of your obsession. It's about you. It's about the person who's obsessed. So I think that Israel here is playing a very important role for the West. It's a blank screen onto which negative characteristics are projected. Nationalism, racism, militarism, colonialism, all the things that liberal people in the West hate, right? It's very difficult as an American to look at Iraq and start dealing with that. Um, um, it's, much, uh, it's much easier to look at Israel and say, those guys, their airstrikes, their checkpoints, their occupation. That sounds familiar, right? Because that's what the US military has been involved in over the past decade and a half, kind of the same kind of thing. Um, but it's much easier to project it onto someone else and condemn them for it than to be really introspective about your own actions. So I think that need is very deep in humanity. I think it's played out through human history uh, many, many times with the Jews being involved in it quite frequently. I think that's what happens, uh, that's what's happening now. And I think that a change in the way we speak or a change in our own pol uh, policy in a, in a small way is unlikely to have a major impact on, on the obsession of Israel, unfortunately. Which is a good segue because anything is going to be a good segue for this final final question, and, and it's sort of on an, on an upswing, and that is, and again from my hearing, listening to you yesterday, you know, what is, you know, there's that perception that you just spoke about, and what is your, tell us your perception, the real story, living in Israel, what's the story that you would want to be told, because that's what we all need to do, what can we do, and um, what's your definition of victory? Um, cherry tomato. Um, that's that's all word, the sound bite you need. Word, exactly. Really simple. Simple. Um, I, um, you know, sometimes in my neighborhood, I live in Jerusalem. I, uh, I live near a really gritty and grimy industrial area called Tapio. Tapio Industrial Zone. Probably most of you have never been there. It's not on the if someone has it. Okay. She's um, yeah, it's generally, the tour buses don't go there. It's, it's pretty uh, gross. It's um, uh, garages and kind of bargain stores. And, um, it's right near where I live, and I'm there almost every day. And you can walk down to the top of the industrial zone, and you'll see um, 
Jews and Arabs working, doing business, getting their cars fixed, going to the supermarket, you know, you see kids coming home from school, um, speaking Hebrew, which is a language that no one spoke 100 years ago, um, you know, uh, in a Jewish majority country where the holidays are Jewish, um, where the culture is Jewish and where you can express your Judaism just by getting on the bus and buying a ticket or by, you know, ordering a pizza. Um, that's amazing. Like, that's a miracle. And I think when we get bogged down in this stuff, as we kind of tend, tend to do, um, or we get fixated on the threats, which are real, and you know, there have always been threats. Uh, they've always been real, more or less. Um, and the genius of Zionism was not to let the threats throw, throw the project off, right? You kept your eyes on the building. And that doesn't matter what other people say. It matters what we do. We just build and build and build. So when I go to Talpia, to the least picturesque place in Jerusalem, with no religious significance, there's no going to the rock, there's no wailing wall, no one thinks it's important, no tourists ever go there, no journalists ever go there. For me, that looks like victory. But that's victory for me. The Talpia Industrial Zone on a Tuesday morning, that's pretty much victory for me. It doesn't fit into a YouTube video or a 600 word um, news article, so it's very hard to, to explain. But every time I'm there, um, you know, I, I know who's winning. It's pretty clear who's winning. Well, thank you, Madi, for, for speaking out. You know, it's what we all need to do to tell, tell your story. So, um, thank you. <laughs> Thank you.